yeah, welcome to the conference. We're going to have a really good time this afternoon. And uh, tonight, we've got some music and some skits and things. We're going to hear live The Holy War with Amber and Alex. That'd be awesome. Have you know The Holy War? And uh, The Holy War starts with this wonderful lyric, where did we come from and why are we here? We're not afraid to ask the big questions in Juxta. And I thought that we might be asking that question of ourselves tonight, but I wanted to ask this question of back ends. Where did they come from, and why are, we, why are they here? So this is my talk. Now, to, to understand the first question, where did they come from, we have to go back to the, the 1990s. Now, in the 1990s, we were having a party, and the drug of choice was objects. Objects were just so cool. Everybody loved objects. Now, if you had a lot of money, you might have been doing small talk, but most of us were trying objects with C++. And then in 1995, Java came out. Now, Java was really cool because everything was an object in Java, um, sort of. I mean, there were primitives that were boxed later. But then we, we were hearing on the grapevines about this other Python language where you know, that was a, the real pure, oh, oh, shit, that was really, really good. Um, but the problem with everybody writing objects and setting state in their objects is that sooner or later, you kind of needed to synchronize and store data and even kind of store data in a, in a, in a database. Um, and so, first of all, p people would suggest to us object uh, fans, why didn't you use SQL? And no, because we just want to use object orientation, thank you very much. So. Um, we created this kind of weird distributed object infrastructure where uh, you'd have an object on one computer and it would be sort of quantum entangled with the, an object on a server somewhere and that being on the server, you were just a bit closer to the database um, and then you had to save it to a, you know, the database using maybe SQL. And, and nobody wanted to use SQL, so we invented a thing called Enterprise Java Beans. Now, I'm actually part of this story because 25 years ago today, that is actually my silver anniversary because I was part of a team with Peter Morgan where we released the world's first EJB 1.0 server. Woo! Um, so I, I, I mean, I'm afraid I wasn't just at the party, I was one of the dealers. And I want to explain to you what Enterprise Java Beans is and how it works. And I've got an architecture diagram here, now, on the right, this, our, cli our client objects are gonna be represented by this cup of tea. And, and then they get kind of quantum entangled through this infrastructure, which we called Corba RMI or IOP, there was, you don't have to know about that stuff, but um, the state found its way to these teapots over here, and they were, storing and saving and loading state from the database, which is represented by this big vat of water here um, with some database administrators. And I, you know, I like this diagram. It's got kind of, you, you had some infrastructure engineers here. Um, there's a, a, an early agile coach at the top left-hand side. Some developers there, Circle CI. And um, you've even got Kent back here dropping some oil on what appears to be Martin Fowler in a pair programming session. So with Elastic Beans, we really had the ability with these magic beans to grow a beanstalk into the clouds. And we actually had our own cloud with EJB. We, they, we used huge boxes. Some of them were so big, you could actually walk inside them and walk around. And the bigger ones had two gigabytes of memory. So we had a kind of an infinite amount of memory for these uh, auto-scaling lambdas, like I, I would call them now. So we had all this technology, but the key thing is that we had this container-managed persistence, this automatic way so you didn't have to worry about the database. Just forget about it. It was wonderful. But over the period of time in the 90s, the web came out, and things started to fall away from this quantum entanglement idea. Um, instead of having objects at the client, we would have web interfaces and browsers. So this whole idea of distributed objects kind of fell by the wayside. And yet, even though 
Enterprise Java Beans begun its long journey in, into a slow, lingering death, the ideas behind having a, an object server and having models and business logic on the server persisted. In fact, another database, you might notice actually all these diagrams, I think, are written by object people because the, the databases are always in a brown color. This is a, a slide from Martin Fowler. Here he is. This is really the architecture, this is 2011, that we still see today. So that's where they came from. And um, I think we've begun to, I like this, this tweet because it really addresses, the, in this tweet is a kind of a recognition of the problem of having compute and state so far away from each other. And there's a lot of people recently been asking the question, well, why don't we go back to the database, or at least why don't we go back to this shared state model? And we've been talking about atomic architecture in, in Juxt, and, and we've been asking questions. Some people are saying, have you tried rubbing a database on it? Jamie Brandon's conference last year. People are really saying, what's wrong with going back to the database? Well, uh, oh, this is the, you know, the origin, the epitomology of site is let's do things in one place, one location, one place. The problem is that databases are really still awful and they need to be fixed. And so we're in this quandary. We've got wonderful object orientation on one side, but then we really know we want to do state management in one place. I like this tweet because it's kind of saying, like, you don't want to touch a database. And it's true, oh, it's like this awful thing over there. You write tests, but don't make them touch the database. Why is this a thing? Um, intrinsically, there's nothing intrinsic with databases that force us not to touch them. I mean, a you know, site has some tests where every test spins up a new version of a new instance of XDDB, fills it with data, does tests, tear it down, does it in milliseconds. So this problem of state is really a legacy problem. These old database vendors built their products not really servicing developers, and they built them in an era where we didn't have tests and so it wasn't really a problem for them. We've got to start talking about this thing as well, right? Databases are just full of these awful, torturous codes, no metadata. I mean, you've seen this stuff, and it's just terrible. And if you've ever been in this trough of hell where you've been trying to write queries, I mean, even queries themselves are like, when you write transactions in a in a language, if you have to, if we're moving our business logic back to the database, oh, please give me a nice language. I don't want to have to ever write PL SQL ever again. I mean, this is what got me running for those object-oriented hills in the first place. Give me this a much, much nicer language. And this is, you know, Babashka running in XDDB. Much, much prefer the stuff on the right. And the interface for databases, SQL, I mean, really, on the web? If you ever actually get to send SQL and execute SQL remotely, right, that's actually considered to be a SQL injection attack. If uh, this uh, injections SQL um, attacks, they're not good words. And so, yeah, we know how to fix this. It's, a, it's having web APIs, having OAuth security. So I, my question is, is if we were able to fix the database, if we were able to replace all the stuff and cruft and all the stuff that we hate about databases, would we actually need to have a middle tier again? Would we need a, a back end? And I'll just leave you kind of with this, this quote, which is that there's a lot of companies that are spending an awful lot of money and spend an AWS dollars on lots and lots of infrastructure. And so kind of we... We kind of owe it to our clients to look for opportunities to reduce their spend. And I think there is, as we move more and more business logic into front-end applications, and we're not so reliant on everything being done on the server side, we should actually question what our backends are actually doing for us. So I'm kind of finishing this talk with this kind of question is that, is it time or when is it time to move back from a three-tier to a two-tier architecture, the two-tier architecture that we used to have back in the days of early 90s PC client server. Uh, so that's really the talk. There's one more thing I wanted to 
announced today, something that uh, Lou and Fortuny have been working on. When you have a two-tier architecture, the, the, only, the only problem is that you have to have security between those two things. And in sight, that security is achieved through OAuth, which means everything has to go through with bearer tokens. Now, how you acquire these bearer tokens, where you store them securely, is actually a, an exercise left for the client developer. And that is quite, there's quite a lot of um, things that you have to worry about. So we've created a library called Pass that's available today. Uh, you can get it from uh, npm install at juxt slash pass. And this does, it goes a long way to taking these problems away from you. You put a OAuth server configuration in its config and it will go and redirect the browser at the right time. It will get the access tokens, store them in a service worker securely, and make sure those access tokens are added to any JS fetch request that you do. So terrific library. It's just kind of come out of the labs and uh, yeah, go play. That's it. Here's a little cute demo that uh, Lou sent me. So we... That's it. We, we don't know who you are. We get you to log in. And then once you've logged in, here's some internal data that you can see. Thanks to everybody in the last two, two and a half years who've uh, helped work on site. I wanted to say thank you very much to, to all those people. Site is now, site 2.0 is now feature complete and ready for people to write applications on top of, so using Pass. So that um, if you want to play around or help with the docs, or there's still quite a lot of work to do for any eager volunteers. So thanks very much. And in particular, I want to give a good thanks for the, to the XDDB team for building such a fantastic database.